Hello class. This week we will be discussing ethics as it relates to management and corporate social responsibility. Determining what is right can be really difficult for managers a lot of times. We've discussed this in class that sometimes um, ethics you know it's 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 harder to come by and harder to implement than we think thus ethics has always been a concern recent widespread moral lapses and corporate financial scandals however bring the topic to the forefront and pressure managers in large and small companies alike to put ethics near the top of their priorities list um, corporations are rushing really to adopt stringent codes of ethics, strengthen their ethical and legal safeguards, and develop socially responsible policies. There was a poll um, that found out that 79% of the respondents believe that questionable business practices are widespread. So not a lot of confidence in our, our businesses within our society. Fewer than one third um, also thought that most CEOs were honest. So that's a small amount that actually think that they're honest. So that's saying many people think that most CEOs are really dishonest, which I don't know. That's that's a little creepy and scary to me. But um, more than 20 percent of U.S. employees surveyed reported having firsthand knowledge of managers making false or misleading promises to their customers, discriminating in hiring or promotions, and violating employee rights. Surprise, surprise. We've talked about this a lot um, in our class discussion so far and a number of companies have begun actually tying managers pay um, to ethical factors such as how well they treat their employees um, or how effectively they live up to their stated corporate values so hmm. with that said um, our objectives for this week um, are to define ethics and explain how ethical behavior relates to the behavior being governed by law and that of free choice. So ethics is difficult to define in a precise way, but we are going to um, try to get a little bit of clarity on this topic this week. We're also going to look at the utilitarian and individualism uh, and moral rights approaches for evaluating ethical behavior. Also, we're going to look at how both individual and organizational factors shape ethical decision making. Um, then we're going to move into corporate responsibility um, and we're going to end with discussing stakeholders, the importance of stakeholders and identifying their value and their place um, within organizations. And so that's what we're going to do um for our discussion and learning this week so let's get with it um let's have some fun with learning this topic so ethics ethics um, is defined as a code of moral principles and values that govern the behaviors of a person or group uh, with respect to what's right or wrong. It's a little different. We, you know, we all have our personal ethics. We all have our personal beliefs and values that shape our everyday lives. Well, companies have their set of ethics um, as well. So ethics set standards as to what is good or bad in conduct um, and decision making within organizations. Ethics also deal with internal values uh, that are part of corporate culture and shape decisions concerning social responsibility with respect to the external environment. Ethics also um, indicate how a person should behave to avoid doing harm to another person. And the essential problem really in dealing with ethical issues and solving moral dilemmas is that there are no absolute or indisputable rules or principles that can be developed um, really to decide whether an action is ethical or unethical. So it's a lot of gray area um, when we're talking about ethics um, and that topic of, um, of ethics. So human behavior um, actually falls into three domains. First, we have our codified law. 
Code of fight law are the values and standards that are written into our legal system. They are our laws, right? They're written um, for our country, for our state, um, and they are enforceable in courts. So it's black and white. This is the law. If you break it, you will go to jail or get in trouble or something, right? Lawmakers have ruled that people and corporations um, must behave in a certain way, um, bottom line, such as for our society, such as, you know, licensing or paying taxes, we are all familiar with. Um, and then there are the second um, domain, um, our ethics, right? So ethics lies between the domains of codified law and free choice. It actually has no specific laws, but they do have standards of conduct that are based on shared principles um, and values about moral conduct. These, uh, this is what guide our individual or um, company um, sort of politics. Because our uh, ethical standards are not codified, disagreements and dilemmas about proper behavior occur over and over and over again because there's so much gray area and people um, all think differently and they have their own perspectives as to what's right or wrong or what should be done or what shouldn't be done. Then we move into our third domain of free choice. Um, free choice pertains to the behavior about which law has no say right it's our freedom and for which an individual or organization um, enjoys complete freedom so um, we have a lot of that we have a lot of areas where we do have um, free choice to make decisions such as hiring and firing someone um, there's no law that we have to hire a certain person or fire someone so um, we have free choice so an ethical dilemma um, arises in a situation concerning right or wrong when values are in conflict and right or wrong cannot be clearly defined so the individual who must make an ethical choice in an organization um, is actually the the moral agent and it can get um, a little um, <laughs> muddy there so several ethical dilemmas are presented that may be faced by managers um, as well as special hypothetical dilemma being used by scientists to human uh, morality studies so in time uh, magazine there was a poll another poll right <laughs> 97 percent of the respondents said that they could throw a switch that would result in saving five people but would almost certainly kill one person wow but only 42 percent said that they could actually push the one person to his death huh that's very interesting um, so if so what this means is if you could save five people but would certainly kill one um, you know what would you do um, if there was a, a, a situation so 97 percent of those people said that they would probably save the five people um, 42 percent said that they um, would push the person to their death it's just it was a weird study a weird poll um, but then Time Magazine so thus that's an ethical dilemma um, it's a hypothetical um, it was um, used by scientists to study human morality just to see, say what you know what are your thoughts what would you do um, very interesting I don't know how what I would do in that situation but you know I'd want to save everybody probably close my eyes and make a decision <laughs> um, so let's move on to our criteria for ethical decision making so there's a strategy um, in place um, for managers faced with making tough ethical choices so thank goodness and this is called a normative strategy and it's based on certain norms and values to guide managers in their decision making um, so normative ethics is based on norms and values and there are four normative approaches um, as you can see here these four approaches um, that describe values for guiding the ethical decision makings for managers so first is our utilitarian approach and utilitarian approach holds that moral behavior produces the greatest good for the greatest number so the decision maker or the manager is expected to consider the effect of each decision alternative on all parties and select 
the one that will optimize the benefits for the greatest number of people. And this is what our utilitarian approach states. And so if I'm taking this approach, um, my thought is, you know, I'm going to do whatever is best for the greater good. Next is our individualism approach. Um, it contends that acts are moral when they promote the individual's best long-term interests. So individualism is believed to lead to honesty and integrity because that works best in the long run. Because individualism is easily misinterpreted to support immediate self-gain, it is really, it's not as popular um, in a highly organized and group-oriented society of today. Next, we move into our moral rights approach. This approach asserts that human beings have fundamental rights that cannot be taken away by an individual's decision. So an ethically correct decision is one that best maintains the rights of those people affected by it. So six moral rights should be considered during decision making. And these moral rights are the right of free consent is the first moral right. Um, individuals are treated only as they knowingly and freely consistent or consent to be treated. The next is right to privacy. Um, individuals can choose to do as they please away from work and have control of information of their private lives. So this would bring up the controversy of Facebook. If companies are allowed to hire or fire us based on our Facebook profiles or um, utilize our Facebook and social media profiles as a key decision making and, and hiring um, people so um, that would challenge that wouldn't it now next is the right of freedom of conscience um, this states that individuals may refrain from carrying out any order that violates their moral or religious norms um, so we, we're familiar with this um, for example if I um, am of the Muslim faith and have to or feel like I need to wear head garb and, and that sort of thing I, I um my thoughts are that these are my morals and I should um be able to do so um because anything other than that would violate these norms right the next is the right uh, of free speech freedom of speech so individuals make criticize truthfully the ethics or legality of actions of others this falls under freedom of speech um, some people take this one a little bit too far but um, you know it nonetheless it's one of the six moral rights and actually is written in our Constitution the fifth one is the right to due process and this one what this means is that individuals have a right to an impartial hearing and fair treatment and finally, the right to life and safety. Individuals have a right to live without endangerment or violation to their health and, and their safety. And so um, these are our uh, more, um, examples of our moral rights approach um, to ethical decision making. And finally and last is our justice approach. And what this holds is that moral decisions must be based on standards of equity, fairness, and impartiality. Um, that's what our, our justice approach um, um, states. So, a manager's ethical choices. Um, ethical and unethical business practices, um, really, they, they usually reflect the values, the attitudes, beliefs, and behavior, and patterns of, our, the, of an organizational culture. And so, ethics is as much an organizational issue a lot of times as it is, is a, a personal issue. And so the manager um, brings specific personality and behavioral traits to the job. Uh, personal needs, family influence, and religious background all shape a manager's value, sy value system. Um, personality characteristics such as ego strength, self-confidence, and a strong sense of independence may enable managers to make ethical choices despite personal risks. So the manager's level or stage of moral development is um, an important personal trait really in making um, ethical decisions. Management um, 
they actually and companies in general they have an obligation really to make choices and take actions that will contribute to the welfare and the interests of society as well as the organization so you know you're an organization you start a business you exist but you do have an obligation um, to welfare of society um, and the interest of others and so this is called corporate social responsibility Corporate social responsibility um, can be a difficult concept to grasp because people have different beliefs as to which actions will actually improve society's um, welfare. Um, so stakeholders um, are actually people that have something to lose or gain based on the actions um, of, of, a, of a company. So the definition of a stakeholder is any group within or outside of an organization that actually has a stake, something to gain or lose in an organization's performance. Each stakeholder actually has a different criteria of responsiveness because it has a different interest in the organization. So as a student, you are actually a stakeholder um, of Rasmussen College. As an employee, I'm a stakeholder, right? So if something happened to the college, I lose my job, you know, I'm miserable, I'm crying, blah, and, you know, I'm broke. So um, you um, hold a stake because you are a recipient of, our, of a product, basically, right? And that's education. But there are other stakeholders. Um, for example, um, for us, we have our advisory board members. And so these are the companies, right, that, who we are saying we're going to teach what's necessary to graduate students that are going to um, give, be able to contribute to an organization. Um, other stakeholders in general can include customers and communities. Um, customers, a lot of people get um, confused by this, but I like to use the Krispy Kreme analogy because I'm pretty mad that there are no more Krispy Kremes in Illinois. I was the biggest stakeholder because it was my favorite. I'm a donut lover and I love Krispy Kreme way 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 more than I do Dunkin Donuts Krispy Kreme was the best donut ever and um, when they left and shut down the last one I was quite quite miserable um, and they're harder to get and so yes I am a stakeholder um, and customers are stakeholders but other um, examples were creditors um, non-governmental organizations research institutes health agencies government suppliers basically anybody um, who has something to gain or lose if something goes wrong with the company. Um, actually, an organization's performance really affects stakeholders, and so socially responsible organizations try to pay attention to all of their stakeholders who are affected by their actions because they understand this. They understand this concept, and they understand that um, their actions have consequences and will affect many. Stakeholders can also have a tremendous effect on the organization's performance and success. So today, um, special interest groups continue to be one of the largest primary um, st uh, stakeholder concerns that companies face. Um, environmental responsibility has also become a primary issue as both business and the public acknowledge the damage that has been done to our, our natural environment. So, um, you know, they part of being socially responsible is just making sure, like, if I'm a factory, that I'm not really polluting or causing harm to the environment. So let's talk about sustainability a little bit. Sustainability refers to economic development that generates wealth and meets the needs of the current generation um, while saving the environment so future generations can meet their needs as well. So in this philosophy, um, managers weave environmental and social concerns into every strategic decision. Um, they revise policies and procedures to support sustainability efforts and to measure their progress um, toward their sustainability goals. Um, organizations actually are embracing the philosophy of sustainability directly, um, mainly be because of their own environmental concerns, but also because of the growing clout of environmental activists. So companies are finding that they can attract more young MBAs and find innovative ways to create wealth while at the same time preserving natural resources. So. 
Um, this leads into um, ethics and codes of ethics and, 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 and policies um, and structures um, developed by companies. And so a code of ethics is a formal statement. And this is not really, this is not to be um, confused with the mission statement because they're very, very different. A code of ethics is actually a formal statement of the company's values concerning ethics um, and social issues. It communicates to employees what the companies stand for. Um, a code of ethics tend to exist in two types. And I tell all of my students um, and anybody really, you know, re if you want to know what a company is about, ask to see their code of ethics or read their code of ethics. See how well it's defined. But the two types um, are principle-based statements. These are designed to affect corporate culture. Um, they define fundamental values, company responsibilities, the quality of their products and the treatment of their employees. So if it's a principle-based code of ethics, it will have those um, elements to it. Um, values, there, um, we as a company, we take responsibility in X, Y, and Z. We uphold the best quality in our products and we treat our employees very well. The second one type of um, code of ethics statement is a policy-based statement. A policy-based code of ethics outlines the procedures to be used in a specific ethical situation, such as marketing or um, procedures in um, an event of a conflict of entrance, interest or observance of laws and proprietary information, equal opportunities, etc., etc. Um, so by offering guidelines for ethical questions, a code of ethics gives employees the responsibility and the right to really maintain an organization's ethical climate. Ethical structures represent um, the various systems, positions, and programs a company can undertake um, in order to implement ethical behaviors. For example, an ethics committee, um, which, you know, they're just a group of executives appointed to oversee the organization's ethics, um, or a chief ethics officer, uh, which is an executive who oversees uh, all aspects of ethics and legal compliance. Or um, another type of structure is ethics training, which are um, many of us are familiar with, which are programs to help employees deal uh, with ethical questions and translate the values stated in the code of ethics into everyday behaviors. Then there's whistleblowing. Um, whistleblowing um, is the disclosure, and you, in order to whistleblow, you have to be an employee um, of the company, but it is the disclosure by an employee of legal and moral or Ill illegitimate practices by an organization. So if I work for the organization and I tell on them or call them into the government or, or whatever compliance, then I am considered to be a, a whistleblower, um, AKA uh, maybe snitch. <laughs> um, some firms have instituted um, innovative programs and confidentiality hotlines to encourage and support internal whistleblowing. I have my thoughts about that. Um, but companies must view whistleblowing as a benefit to the company and make dedicated efforts actually to protect their whistleblowers um, for this practice to be um, effective ethical safeguard. Um, that's what's supposed to happen. Um, a lot of times it's not what actually happens, but this is what, what's supposed to be. Um, I come from, you remember, the pharmaceutical industry, and whistleblowing was um, actually quite um, frequent or quite, um, I don't know, it was done a lot um, back when I was working in pharma. I saw it all the time because there are such um, stringent government guidelines um, as it relates to the, the pharmaceutical industry. So this is something that I saw um, often, um, unfortunately, when I worked in, in pharma. So most managers now, to wrap this up, most managers now realize that paying attention um, to ethics and social responsibility is as much of a business issue um, as paying attention to cost, paying attention to profits and growth. Uh, managers are often concerned about whether good citizenship will hurt their performance. And so studies have generally found that there is a positive relationship between social responsibility and financial performance. These studies actually provide an indication that use um, 
the use of resources for ethics and social responsibility does not hurt companies. And so companies are making an effort really to measure the non-financial factors that create value. Um, people really prefer to work for companies that demonstrate a high level of ethics and social responsibility. And so although doing the right thing may not always be profitable in the short run, it may create um, a competitive advantage by developing a level of trust um, that money actually can't buy. So it really, really pays all in all um, to, to be ethical. Um, for for a company um, and 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 as and as individuals.